Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 77 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. As I was saying last week, one of the best ways to get to know the medieval period is to read the words of medieval people themselves. Even in translation, they offer first-person perspectives of what it was actually like to live in those times. And often, what it was like to live in those times isn't everything we might think it was. This week, Peter Konechny from Medievalist.net got me to read one of the most famous chronicles of the Middle Ages, The Chronicle of the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds by Jocelyn of Breakland. If you're looking for a monastic chronicle that gives you the day-to-day -day life of a monk, this isn't it. Instead, Jocelyn most often chronicles the worldly concerns of the abbot about the abbot's debts. The monetary monastery, if you will. Here's my conversation with Peter about Jocelyn's Chronicle, what it shows us about the worldly dealings of one of the most powerful monastic communities in 12th century England, and some of the gossipy stuff that you might actually hear monks getting up to. All right, so welcome, Peter, to my basement, <laughs> life in the time of COVID. So we're going to be talking today about the Chronicle of the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds, which I'd never read before, and I think it's super interesting. So tell us a little bit about the Chronicle of the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds. Yeah, yeah. It's written by a guy named Jocelyn of Breaklord. He is basically this young monk, uh, and he's writing uh, around the end of the 12th century, early 13th century. And it's not... Um, a chronicle about uh, uh, the worldly events is really a chronicle about what's happening in this monastery, uh, who's doing what, what's happening with their kind of relations with the the town around them and uh, with other, like uh, other people in England. But it's very focused on what's happening in the, this abbot uh, in this abbey. Yeah, and Jocelyn's somebody who's been in, it seems that he's been part of monastic life since he was a kid. He probably went to school in the monastery. He joined up when he was about 17 or 18, and then he starts chronicling stuff. And uh, Bury St. Edmunds is actually a really important abbey in England. Do you want to talk about its place in England? Yeah, it's it starts out in early 11th century, uh, and it's where uh, Saint Edmund de Mart Martyr, one of like uh, uh, I believe he's a 10th century king. He dies. He's con considered holy, so uh, they bring him here. They kind of start a monastery here, and it's one of those ones that kind of in the 11th and 12th, 13th century, it, it grows. It's one of those main ones, so um, a little uh, east of London. Uh, where you know it's got enough uh, owns enough land as kind of a major landowner, but it's also a place where people come as pilgrims, including kings who will come and visit. So it's it has that business, uh, and it's kind of just uh, it seems like if we look at like uh, abbeys, it's probably in the top five in England. So. Yeah, so the Abbey actually has control not only of a whole bunch of land, including stuff like fish ponds and game parks and abbeys, but also tenured farms and things like that. But they also have a lot of control over the town and over justice in the town and all sorts of things that you normally would associate with maybe lordship, right? Yeah, like it's one of the cases where there's the Abbey first and the town kind of grows around it. So the abbey is able to have all these benefits coming to it. So like they would own the mills. Uh, and this is like something like, you know, often in the, in the later Middle Ages, this is a, a bone of contention where like this town's people like, ah, we don't want to be paying the, the abbey all this money, having them, you know, rule over us. But like the abbot said, like, well, this is our land. This is how we started. It's not our fault that, you know, your great, great, great grandfathers, you know, thought this was a cool, cool place to come to. So... But yeah, it's uh, it's one of the questions where it's a town that grows around the abbeys. Yeah, and so when we think of medieval monasteries, I think often we think of these monks, they're spending all their time reading or studying or writing and all that kind of stuff. But when you have an abbey like this, where they own so much and they administer so much for the community, it actually is a lot more like a business. And you were talking just before we started recording about the abbot of Bury St. Edmunds acting a lot like a CEO. So tell us a little bit about the abbot that's kind of the main character of this chronicle. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, so, early on in a chronicle, uh, there's a new abbot that comes to uh, uh, gets elected. His name is Samson. So, uh, Jocelyn explains that before there was a really nice abbot, a uh, really good guy, but he didn't know how to manage money. 
So the the Abbey is just kind of losing, you know, a few hundred pounds worth of money each year. Their accounts get a little less. You know, things are are, are slack and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and so he knows Samson uh, has been in in the mo- monastery. I think for like about fifteen years at this point, he's been kind of working his way up. Uh, there's a, a part where like you know Jocelyn goes to Samson. Oh, things are so terrible here, and like all these they call them flatterers <laughs> are in control. So like all the kind of yes men, I guess, and stuff. And like Samson says, yeah, this is the dark hour, but we can't do anything about it right now. We we got bite our time, and you know wait for the opportunity. And the opportunity comes. They had like the abbot. Abbot dies. They have an election. Samson gets in charge, and he starts to change everything around. So, and this 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 chronicle is really a fascinating portrait of a person who has to manage things and be essentially a CEO. And it's like I I think I calculated when I did this article, I calculated that. Uh, when the when he becomes abbot, they owe the equivalent of like 1.6 million pounds. They're in debt, and that's like it's his driving motivation is to get rid of this debt. So, which uh, you know, uh, so it's uh, and so we 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 read about all these things that he has to do. So, uh, and it, it's just a fascinating list of how to you know what a monastery actually does. And, you know, all the kind of ways they have to do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, setting the scene before Samson becomes abbot, the abbey owns, it owes so much money, like you're saying, just like so much money. And it keeps sinking deeper and deeper into the hole, in part because they're getting loans at interest. And this is actually kind of a, a key part of the chronicle. There are a lot of different people in the abbey sort of independently are getting loans at interest. And they're getting loans from the Jews, which is something that is uh, becomes sort of important in the story. It's something that you can pull from the story and actually learn quite a lot about how the Jews were treated in uh, Bury St. Edmunds. But this is something that not all of the people in the Jewish community in the Middle Ages were moneylenders, but that's who's kind of featured in this chronicle. And so Samson, he really has a thing against the Jewish community in Bury St. Edmunds. And they talk about how before Samson becomes abbot, the Jews are able to to walk around the abbey grounds and like they are sheltered at one point the women and children are sheltered when there's some unrest Um, but then things really turn around for that community so samson doesn't only crack down on the debts that the abbey owes but he really kind of takes it out on the jewish community and he finds an excuse to expel them from bury st edmunds Um, and that being there is a rumor that a little boy who was killed was ritually murdered and so everyone takes up arms against the Jewish community. It's actually a massacre. It's horrible. Um, and then they're expelled by Abbot Samson. So he's he's really kind of, he takes this debt to heart. And pretty much everything he does from the time he becomes Abbot is based on money, including, you know, expelling an entire community. Yeah, like, uh, you know, one of the things right away we learn is that their record keeping was terrible when he gets in the part. Like they said, you know, we just have a few scraps of paper where, you know, what the knights kind of owed us. And that's that's all we had. And so he goes into this process of like, all right, we got to figure out what this farm uh, does or what it owes us. We have to make sure that they pay. Like, it doesn't matter. They've been getting away for the last generation or 50 years. We got to, you know, get them for that, those eggs that they owe every month. And, um, and just, uh, you have this fasting where it's, they're coming in to uh, collect debts, right? Like, uh, and make little uh, improvements against whoever's renting them, like trying to figure that out and also buying back debt, right? Like, you know, it's like there's one point where uh, this one of these officials, I think he was the seller, is like, oh, he had run up like 300 pounds in debt. And like, uh, so uh, Samson fires, essentially fires him from the job. He gets, they get, I love it. They get, you know, kind of put into the monastery. They just like, they, they're confined to the monastery. So that's their life. Uh, but, and like, there's some murmurs against him. He, he just brings out all these bills that this person had accumulated. You know, look at all these things that this guy had, uh, had done to rack up debt. You know, do you, you know, do you still think I did a bad thing about, you know, firing him? <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah, there's a couple of really dramatic scenes in the chapter house. There's one where you feel, see him like dumping out this bag of all of these sealed documents, like you're saying, where it's like, here are all the things he owes. There's another time where he's like, okay, everybody in this monastery who has their own private seal that they've been using, everybody put it on the table right now. And it's like 33 seals amongst the monks that they, they've been using to get loans on a lot of stuff that's like, based against the monastery's wealth and stuff so it's like and there's one more moment i think where he's like okay everybody hand over the money that you owe or hand over the money that you have and you can just have a little bit that you can give to charity but the rest comes to me and it's like all these monks like emptying their pockets of all this money and it's really dramatic in how he's collecting all this money and starting to like rebuild it he really is tight fisted yeah, it's like, it's funny that you think of it as a corporate like world. You've got all these mid-level managers, right? Like that's, that's literally all the monks are mid-level managers. Some are more important, some are others. Uh, and they're all kind of running things and they're all kind of, looks like, it seems like half of them are scheming, right? Like there's one case where there's this one monk and he says, a week, he, he, you know, he had these worldly appetites, but he was really good at his job. He managed these four farms, right? And so we kept him on the job uh, for a long time until, like, the kind of scandals piled up. And then, yeah, we had to remove him and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, it's just, a, you know, Samson has, you know, he's he often complains, like, oh, you know, like, it's just making my life, you know, a misery. You know, I wish I could be the librarian. Like, he says, like, I wish I could be the librarian and, like, don't have to worry about all this. But every night, uh, I, you know, I just go to bed thinking about all the debts we owe. Yeah, I think he's posturing a bit because there's one point, Jocelyn's actually a really gossipy kind of chronicler, which I love. And so he's always saying, you know, this person thought this and this other person thought that. And one time I talked about somebody and now we're not friends anymore. So he's always <laughs> talking about stuff like that. And there's one monk, he says, somebody read what I've written and they said, you're just trying to flatter the abbot because the abbot does all sorts of bad things. Like he takes money on the side or he sells off like heiresses into marriages and stuff that's not his business and so i don't think that the abbot actually wanted to be a librarian i think that's just that's just a lot of hot air yeah 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 like he like, is like you know he's like jocelyn like i can almost see this like you know jocelyn kind of looks up to this abbot and like this abbot's like sometimes he just gets frustrated and he takes it out on jocelyn right like uh he's just you know he's his smithers I think that's kind of apt in a lot of ways, actually. Although this might be a good time to describe what Samson looks like because uh, he doesn't look like Mr. Burns. Okay, so this is what Jocelyn's written about Samson. So he says, Abbot Samson was of medium height and almost completely bald. His face was neither round nor long and he had a prominent nose and thick lips. His eyes were crystal clear with a penetrating gaze and he had extremely sharp hearing. So he probably heard a lot of people gossiping about him. This is my favorite part. His eyebrows were bushy and were frequently trimmed. So a little bit vain as well. As soon as he caught a slight cold, he became hoarse. On the day of his election, which uh, the editor has said is the 28th of February, 1182. He was 47 years of age and had been a monk for 17 years. There were then only a few gray hairs in his red beard, and very few indeed in his hair, which is black and wavy. But within 14 years of his election, he had turned as white as snow. He was a very serious-minded man and was never idle. His health was excellent, and he liked to travel on horseback or on foot until he was prevented by old age. So, like, that's the kind of detail about how somebody looks that you'd never get anywhere else. So it's actually such a valuable chronicle in that way. Yeah, like, this, it's like this... It's, this chronicle is, is probably well known among like medievalists, uh, but it's not a very important. Like you don't read this to learn about the history of England in any way. It's just a, like a fascinating little story about this one community and what they're doing. Uh, and it it it's rarely touches on. It does touch on like wider events, but it's often like oh, King Richard arrives and he comes and he stay. And the, of course, the monks are trying to get money from him right like they're trying to get donations and stuff like that of course richard dies just before like they, they can like land him and john comes in so king john arrives like right after his coronation and they said like we were really hoping for all you know a big donation 
But all he gave us was this, these silks that we had loaned him anyways. He didn't even pay us back for the loan. That's what he gave us. He gave us 13 shillings on the last day of his trip. Oh, uh, so... Yeah, and you picture like John's brought his whole entourage, right? They'd have to feed them and house them and all that stuff. And all John did was give them silks that were theirs anyway. Whereas his mom, they say that, you know, Eleanor always made sure that they had this one chalice, I think it was. And they tried to give it away for something as a gift and she kept buying it back to them. So I think, you know, comparatively, John is just a cheapskate, man. <laughs> It's fascinating, like, like they have a hunting park in there and they're like trying to keep it up with game and like you can just see this, like this is a tourist place. This is like for the, you know, we have pilgrims, you know, people come for the pilgrimage, but they're really staying for the hunting. And they argue a lot about whose responsibility it is to pay for the guests that are coming. And they're like, okay, if it's more than 13 horses, you know, this person has to pay for their their stay. And if it's less, it has to be this person. And if they're religious people, then it's this person. But it's like, whose budget is this going to come out of, right? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it really, it just feels with all of corporate. That's what, what you get. Like you have a big company. And this is managing it, and every you know people have got jobs to do, uh, and it, it just if it, it's it was mind blowing when I kind of read it that way as like a corporation and talking about like this could be like Apple, right? Like this is <laughs> so. Yeah, and who's going to get this next post, right? Is it going to be this person? This person may be more qualified, but they're not very nice. And this person is nicer, but they're not very qualified. And they have these debates back and forth about who's going to be elected. And actually, when Samson's elected, they have to ask the king's permission for them to elect somebody. And it's got little bits like where King Henry's like swearing by God's eyes and stuff. <laughs> it's kind of awesome. <laughs> So there's one story I really, one of the stories I really enjoyed. It involves the Bishop of Ely, and I guess he has certain rights uh, over the abbey. And he he comes in and he sends a messenger saying, "I want to get uh, timber." And so I'll, I'll kind of read it off. So you know, although the abbot was reluctant to grant this, for he for he did for, uh, fear of offending the uh, bishop. Uh, then when he was staying at Melford, one of the bishop's clerks came with his master's request that the promised wood should be taken from Elmswell. But Elmswell was a slip of the tongue, for Elmset was the name of the wood at Melford. The abbot was surprised at this message, for Elmswell could not supply that sort of timber. However, when Richard the Forester of Melford heard about it, he told the abbot privately that the, that the previous week the bishop had sent his carpenters to Elmset as spies, and they had selected the best trees in the whole wood and put their marks on them. Hearing this and realizing that the bishop's messenger had made an error, the abbot answered that he was happy to agree to the bishop's request. The following day, after messenger had left, as soon as the abbot had heard mass, he went with his carpenters into the wood and ordered that all the marked oaks, over a hundred more, should be marked again, this time with his own sign for St. Edmund and should be felled without delay for use of the, the great tower. When the bishop understood the messenger that the timber had been taken from Elmswell, he reprimanded him severely and sent him back to the abbot to, with the correct Elmswell to Elmset. But before the man reached uh, the abbot, the trees that the bishop had, had desired and the carpenters had marked had already been felled. If his lordship wanted timber, he would have to find other trees elsewhere. When I heard this, I laughed and said to myself, this is an example of a trick being trumped. <laughs> yeah, it's like the person who is in charge of all these souls, like not just the souls at the monastery, but the souls of like the surrounding region. This is the kind of move that he pulls. Like it's not something that you'd expect such a holy man to actually pull, but he does. I think it's hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's great. It, it, it's just like this fascinating, like where the, it, it I, if you're listening to this, you're probably thinking, is there any religion in this? Do they have anything? Did they do any good works? And they do. Like, the, the abbot is, he builds a school for, his, uh, for like, uh, younger students. Uh, he, there's, he, there's various building works and stuff like that. Uh, and that happens, right? But it, it very much, this is, the monastery is running a business with charity on the side. <laughs> that's, 
with good things on the side, but it's mainly running the business in a sense, like even like a company today, you know, they'll, you know, help promote good things and they want to think of themselves as good, but they have to run their business first. So. Yeah. And you don't always see that when you're talking about or chronicling, you know, the happenings of an Abbey or something, you don't always see the business side. And I do think it's worth thinking about the fact that Jocelyn's going to write down the stuff that's unusual, right? He's not going to write down like today we chanted this many Psalms because that's what they're going to do every day. So it's, he's writing down the stuff that's unusual, but at the same time, it is very much a business that they are running. And this is where you see, you know, people getting a little bit jaded about the church's power or its money or how it's using it. And, the, you know, the people who are in charge of them and their farms and things like that. There's one point at which the abbot expands his fish pond and there's great complaints from the community because he's flooded people's orchards and he's flooded some of their back gardens and stuff. And they, people come to him and say like what are you doing man like this this is encroaching on our property and he's like i'm not gonna shrink my fish pond it's my fish pond <laughs> you know he's that kind of a guy yeah they like jocelyn at that's what we're, we're for a few times jocelyn actually says critical things about him right but uh jocelyn as it goes on he gets a little more uh understands what the you know that the samson's not the greatest guy in the world right but uh he yeah, like he he's like one of those type. Like there's, I guess in the in monasteries, there seems to be these two kinds of abbots. There's the ones that are really pious, and you know they they uh, they make sure that the flock are well taken care of spiritually. And then there's the monks, uh, the abbot that has to take care of them physically. So, uh, you know, so like yeah, when like he's kind of giving them less food to eat and give, taking away all their luxuries and stuff like that you know he's not doing it for spiritual reasons he's just doing, doing the cut costs <laughs> yeah it's a budgetary thing but he does things like when uh, near the end of the chronicle they have to get someone elected as prior so, so the prior is the person who's in charge of the actual monks and their spiritual health and stuff and they're like well we could get these people some of them are not very um pious or they're not very experienced but they put forth some names and the abbot's like i'm gonna call some names and then we'll see if you like these guys and then one of the people just kind of like drops the name of the guy that abbot actually wants and he's like oh did you say hubert yeah i think he should be it do you everybody does everybody agree and he just kind of like forces this through and he just makes it happen and but there's some things i think that um as jocelyn kind of indicates kind of indirectly like i think samson starts off as maybe less jaded himself or less cynical or maybe less self-serving as at the beginning because he has a whole bunch of relatives as happens you know when you get some success a whole bunch of relatives come out of the woodwork and ask him for jobs and stuff and he puts them off and he hires the people that he thinks are right but you see that happening less and less as the chronicle goes on he gets more self-serving it, it, it's when I think we almost see like well, when like the monasteries and the, like a new monastic movements that kind of come up is like, you know, the they often say, oh, the the previous uh, abbeys and previous monks they just became too worldly. Like we have to we have to focus on you know what matters, right? So I, you can see that kind of like this is just one kind of snapshot of what how a monastery can evolve, right? For you know it it has a you know where we have you know originally they have very good intentions and they want to be very strict with their religious uh, vows but you know it grows it, it, it becomes this business people i'm sure a lot of people that became monks you know really like the idea of running things and uh you know being involved in this kind of company right and uh that kind of you know personal power and you see that kind of erode into it so you have it where like it becomes not just you know like a, a kind of a religious house but a business right and then you see that backlash and you get oh that seems to happen right throughout the middle ages right where we you know, in when should we get like franciscans where it's like we have to be poverty like we can't accept anything we just beg uh and then <laughs> then you see franciscans that are you know not just begging but living off pretty well you know like the begging off the scraps of the king's table you know so it's not 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 too not too bad but they uh and then you know it, it, you, that do you have that whole cycle like and you can see how people like the general community could get eventually like you know 
why you know the, the monastery you know is just you know, a bunch of guys you know that a bunch of white men running things are they more pious than we are and you do see that i mean you do see that especially in the later middle ages you see a lot well always but you do see it a lot in the later middle ages where you have the fat fire stereotype right or you have like chaucer's making fun of just about every religious person you know in the canterbury tales except for the one guy the partner not the partner the parson um but everybody yeah People get more cynical about the clergy, and this is kind of one of the reasons why. But thinking about the township, like people outside the monastery, there's a couple of places where the abbot is really kind of clutching a power that he has, and it's not a fiscal power this time. It's his actual spiritual power. Like, he gets annoyed at people, and he threatens them with excommunication, or he actually excommunicates people. So, like, there's this one time where there's tournaments happening across England. There's one that comes onto their property. The abbot's not happy, but the tournament goes ahead. And so the abbot just excommunicates everybody that was involved in the tournament. Or like another time, I don't remember what the occasion was. I think it was around a holiday. People are in the the cemetery and they're cavorting and stuff. And then it turns to fisticuffs and then it turns to, it says bloodshed. And then the abbot's getting ready to excommunicate all these people. And all of a sudden there's all of these people outside of like the abbot's place. And they're all stripped down to their underwear on their knees, like hoping not to get excommunicated. And he gives them trouble. And I think they do get like a physical punishment as well. But then then things are okay. So he does wield the spiritual power over the community as well. And he uses it to control them. And I don't want to be completely cynical and say this is just because he's power hungry. It's possible, you know, he was looking out for their souls. But he does it in a way that I think the community maybe didn't always appreciate. Yeah, yeah. I think, like, I I would be less, I'll be a little more cynical. And, like, (laughs) like, his personality does not come across as the pious you know, you know, I want to look after your soul, right? He, he is, you know, I want to run things my way. Uh, everyone listen, cause you're all a bunch of idiots, <laughs> you know, you're you, you, like, cause, and like, that's like, if he says like, you know, all I think about is dealing with debts and money and like, uh, he just, you know, he just wants to run the thing and he wants to, that's how he wants to be remembered as a good administrator and like sometimes it's like it's just i always make some power plays uh like on the local nights which all owe him money right like they're all you know the in one way or another like like there's tons of people that owe him service or rent and i he has kind of i think he just has to find ways of uh you know showing them he's the boss Yeah, it's true. And it's funny he has so much agency and he's one of these people that you know is as the abbot of Bury St. Edmunds, he is associated with the court, right? There's one point at which Richard is trying to get knights ready so that he can go and fight in France. And uh, he's called up his knights and the abbot can't get a bunch of knights to go. So he hires some and Richard's like, oh, you know, I don't want money. I want knights. So the abbot hires these knights. And then people are saying to the abbot, like, it's great that you provided these knights, but, um, it looks like Richard might be at war for like a year and these knights are going to get expensive. So maybe you need to like negotiate a deal. (laughs) And so he negotiates this deal with Richard where he's like, I'll pay you a lump sum. And after like 40 days, these mercenaries go home because I can't afford them any longer. It's like the wheeling and dealing that you see, you know, in, in the higher levels of court as well is an interesting facet of this too. It's just a, like, a, you know, like this work is just like a fascinating little microcosm of medieval society, uh, of people like trying to get ahead uh, and people having to worry, you know, about like things just like getting on with life and dealing with, you know, the issues of work. Right. So uh, it, was, it was I really found it, uh, you know, really a fascinating like you come across it. It's a very thin book. It's not like it's uh, it's something you can get done in a couple hours of reading. So, but it's it's a fascinating little story. So, yeah, and I really like listening to Jocelyn's style and how he gives accounts of both things. He tells tales on himself and all these things. And I wanted to hear like more about what's going on with Jocelyn and stuff. But the chronicle just abruptly ends. 
So it's possible that poor Jocelyn just bit the dust. He didn't give us any warning about it. You know, he just kind of stops. He's in the middle of talking about, well, I think he's finished the story about business. But then, yeah, he just, it just ends. And you kind of want to find out what happened to Jocelyn. We don't actually really know what happened to him. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting little story. And it's, it's, it's interesting to picture this young monk actually like writing down what's going on and having you know other monks looking over his shoulder and reading back to him and criticizing it like it's just an interesting little book like you say oh and I don't know if it's phrased the same way in your translation we'll have to drop our translations in a second but in mine there is somebody that uh, from the community who mentions that Samson will blind every one of us with his science and I mean that's that's enough reason to love the book just in general. Okay, so what translation were you reading? Uh, I have the one. It's uh, Oxford uh, Oxford's World Classics, and it was done by Diana Greenway and Jane Sayers. So it's Oxford University Press. I have the same one, but it's just a different edition of that. So we're both reading from the same translation. So yeah, you can find these I think pretty easily, and like Peter says, they're a pretty slim volume. But like like you were also saying, Peter, like this is something that lots of medievalists have read it's something that people have in their back pockets even if I was a delinquent that hadn't read it before now so it's something that's worth worth reading if you want to learn more about just kind of as you say a microcosm of medieval life yeah if you like uh, we, there are plenty of kind of chronicles that are written by abbots uh we you know um there's one about uh, the chronicle of saint albans that i've been reading there's really kind of a fascinating kind of uh, 14th and 15th century uh kind of well, a lot of it is about the monastery but this is uh like probably one of the best kind of uh, small little works you can come across uh, about the middle ages yes yeah i love me some primary sources Okay, is there anything you want to tell us about what's on the website this week, Peter? Oh, okay. Uh, we are on part two of the uh, Robin Hood uh, series by um, a- Andrew Latham, and he's looking at out- outlaws in, in medieval England. So uh, we have that. We also have... We have my article on rabbit farming. Oh, yeah, I was about to mention that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we have, yours was great. Like, oh, you know, again, you know, it's a bit of like uh, monasteries involved, like just with, you know, like, hey, we have to manage rabbits and they were both uh, food and fashion, so. Yeah, it was crazy. I didn't actually realize people farmed rabbits. I thought they were kind of indigenous to like the United Kingdom, but no, people are actually farming them and they were pretty expensive. And I just really enjoyed the article that I read about it. So I wanted to share that information to get you to read that article too. So anything else? Yeah, we also have, we just announced the book of the month uh, for the people that's kind of signed up this month, what they would get in October. And if you really liked our podcast talking about Romance of the Three Kingdoms, so this is uh, a pair of books of one of a a fifth century source of when the Three Kingdoms, uh, about how they emerge and how it uh, kind of, the uh, f- kind of fall of the of the Han Dynasty in in the uh, end of the second century. So we're teaming up with like uh, a person who's doing translations of all of these kind of early uh, chronicles, uh, and he's been able to uh, give us uh, like a, a physical one and a digital one. And I, I I'm actually really looking forward to reading it because I love you know all these kind of sources. So. Uh, so this is a bit earlier uh, than most of our kind of stuff. So, uh, but I think I think you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, and you get a twofer this time. You get a digital copy and a physical copy of stuff that was featured in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Peter, for talking to me and and encouraging me to read Jocelyn's little book. I appreciate it, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks, thanks, and uh, thanks for having me down in your basement, in your dungeon. Anytime. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for your support each and every month. Whether you're in it for the sweet deals on our magazine subscriptions, our book club, or our exclusive maps illustrated by Tina Ross, it's your support that keeps this going, so thank you so much. If you'd like to become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, you can find out more about all our rewards at Patreon.com slash Medievalists. I'd like to give a special shout out this week to Noah Tetzner, host of the History of Vikings podcast, who's joined forces with me as of this week to take over the editing of the podcast. 
to my great relief. <laughs> For almost two years, I've been doing this myself and flying by the seat of my pants. So I am super excited to welcome Noah to the Medieval Podcast, and I hope that you'll welcome him too. For everything from Chronicles to Conies, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find all my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, on Amazon. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an awesome day.